Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. Hello, and welcome to Careers Unwrapped. I'm your host, Mark Fawcett, and with me today is David Grant. David is a primary school teacher uh, based in Glasgow, based in Scotland, but there's much more to him than that. He's also very widely known from TikTok with his platform, Organized Educator. He shares about the joys, the struggles of being a teacher. Uh, he also hosts his own podcast, Inside Voices, a teacher podcast, and he also publishes his own teaching resources. So we're going to be talking about his teaching career and hopefully giving some insights into the real life of being a busy teacher. So David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. Thanks. I, I think I'd start with why teaching? What was the catalyst at the beginning that made you think, that's for me? This is a really interesting one because I never actually wanted to be a teacher um, early on. So my story is a little bit different to most people. A lot of people get into teaching because they want, they've wanted to do it since they were four or five years old. You know, it's always been what they wanted. But actually for me, I went to university and did two years of accountancy and finance and it just wasn't for me. Um, now the benefit of being in Scotland is we get university for free. So essentially what happened was, I, I mean, I, I told this whole story on my podcast, but essentially what happened was I, I ended up failing my way through it and realizing that it just wasn't my goals to be sitting behind a desk all day. That just wasn't what I wanted to do. And I had been doing a lot of youth work, um, like summer camps and clubs within the village that I lived in and things like that. And I loved it. And my parent, my mum and my sister were teachers. So I kind of had like a, a, an in there. But I think that's also the reason I didn't want to do it <laughs> because I heard about it all the time. So essentially, yeah, it was something that was almost I fell into it. But when I did fall into it, it was something that I found was a passion and was something that I just absolutely loved. Um, so yeah, not the normal route into teaching, but one, well, I said this as well, that not many people have a normal route into a career. So mine has just taken a couple of different turns. We have uh, a thread in common there that I didn't know in that I started the university doing accountancy, <laughs> accountancy with computer science. Right. Uh, so we both started the accountancy. You ended up in teaching. My first job after university was in the army. Wow. And clearly neither of us were destined to be accountants. Yes. This is no hate to like accountancy, but it just wasn't for me. Like just, I couldn't, I couldn't face it basically. And so when you thought, okay, despite trying to avoid the family career route here, I actually, I'm going to go for this. On practical levels, what did you have to do in, in the Scottish education system to, to train and become qualified as a teacher? Um, so obviously I had to get good grades to get into accountancy and finance. So you had to pretty much, and to get into Glasgow University, you pretty much had to have straight A's. Um, and so I worked and worked and worked for that. So that set me up pretty well to then be able to go into whatever I wanted to do. So for example, when I left accountancy, I had offers for law and I, like I just spread my net pretty wide and I could have gone and done a couple of things. Um, but then because I had done accountancy and not like a social science or something, I couldn't transfer. So I had to do the four year degree. So in Scotland, we do four years um, for primary teaching. Well, every degree is pretty much four years. I think in England, it might be slightly different at three years, but I'm not sure. Um, so I had to go back and do a whole four years after having done two already, which was not the best, but it just had to be done. So when I did that four years, I finished and I had the option to do a master's, which I didn't do, which I could have done. Um, but I just needed out of university at that point. Like I'd done too much. And then in Scotland, we have something different as well. We have a, we have an NQT or newly qualified teacher year, but it is given to you. So it's called a probation year, um, historically, and you get a paid year for work and then you're officially qualified. So it's very different from the English system. Um, and you chose primary teaching. Yeah. And. Primary education is, uh, well, most primary teachers are women. Yeah. And, and there are many primary schools with, with zero or just one or two male teachers in it. So what was the, the reasoning behind you going to the younger age groups? Essentially because it is what I'd done. So I, I, I had like, I had been into my mum's school 
like she used to drag us in to, to help with <laughs> different clubs and things. So I had worked with younger children and I enjoyed that. I'm also five foot eight and <laughs> like high school students just, it just wouldn't be for me. But really the issue was if I wanted to do high school, I would have to have a degree in a subject. I don't know what it is. The system is in England. I'm not sure. But in Scotland, you have to have a degree and then you get your, in Scotland, it's a postgraduate diploma, PGDE. I think it might be a PGCE. I can't remember which one's which in England or Scotland, but you would then have to get your, your final. So I didn't have that. So I literally could not have become a high school teacher. It just wasn't an option, you know. And what's what's the school like you work in at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's brilliant. It's a small school. We've only got about 200, 240, something like that. It's kind of like a village school, but in a town. So it's got that vibe of really tight-knit community, which is nice. Um, there's only one class per year group. and yeah, it's, it's just a great place to work, to be honest. I really can't complain. I've been there for, this is my fourth year now. So. And four years in, looking back on your expectations when you started, what has been perhaps most different in reality from the expectations you had at the beginning? Well, te- uh, technically, this is my second school. So I think this is my fifth year. And like I said, we get that first year. So I was in a different school for that. And then and then I got my final job. Expectations. Um, I didn't expect, to get as much leadership opportunities as quickly. I thought I would have quite a few years of just teaching. And then what you realize in schools is if you show a talent for anything, like if you show an interest in anything, um, it's very quickly becomes your thing in the school. Uh, So I'm quite interested in technology. So I'm like the STEM guy. (laughs) Like I was just thrust upon me almost, you know, it was that kind of, I didn't really ask for this, but if you do start to show that really early on, they'll give you leadership opportunity. That's been my experience and it might not be everyone's. Um, that would be the biggest difference, I think. There's something in there that a lot of us, myself, listeners, might recollect from our own school days is that where you came across a teacher who had a passion point, and it might have been the teacher who just loved uh, chess or they liked hiking or they liked canoeing or musical theatre. If they had a big passion for it and the school leadership just let them run with it, then that school would just grow and grow and grow in that area and, and be known for it. And do you find you're able to not just be the person who's asked to fix the IT because you're the yeah. tech guy, but do, are you the person who's allowed to start thinking more about digital skills and inspiring the use of, of technology, both amongst your young students, but also amongst other teachers? Yeah, 100%. I mean, we, not to, this sounds like a big suck up moment, but our management team, our leadership team are very good at giving opportunities not just with the children but with staff we also have an adjoining school so we have a, a denominational school that's and we do a lot together with them um so yeah we have like opportunities to lead inset days we have opportunities to go and learn from other schools like we this year have been to other um schools to learn from them during school time so we get time out to go and do that and i think it's helpful because like although you're passionate about something you want to see it have an impact you don't just want to be the guy that likes canoeing or the, the guy that likes golf so he does a golf club. Like You actually want to see it embedded and the learners then start to, to pick up on that as well. So yeah, that's really helpful when you get opportunities like that to go and actually build it into the curriculum, build it into the school life, which is, which is nice. And you've spoken before about using AI, in particular ChatGBT and how it saves you time for things like marking papers. And I know that some parents would immediately think that their jaws would hit the floor if they think that a teacher was using AI to, to mark their, their child's paper. But how actually does that help you both improve the job and save time at the same time? So I've never actually used it to mark an assignment because in primary school, that's just not really, like we don't do that kind of level of work. Like I don't have them submitting essays and things. So what I really use it for in terms of my workload Listen, it's not all the time, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's few and far between. But what I do use it for is um, ideas and planning. So that would be the main things. So for example, um, there's lots of different ones that you can get. So I can't even remember, Teach Mate is one of them and um, Lesson Lab and things. There's just like a million out there now that you can go on and you can put in, okay, I need a lesson for boom, boom, boom. And it'll give you ideas. They're not amazing. Like they're not foolproof you still have to take those ideas and turn them into a lesson you still have to deliver those ideas but what it does do is it might take that time that you would have sat on the internet trawling through or looking through the books in the school and it finds that information for you instantaneously and it puts it into structure 
as well, the admin tasks that it can do is just unbelievable. Like we, it can write reports, which I don't use it for, but it can. Uh, it can write um, like policy documents and things. So things that would just take time, it can just do it so well, so quickly. So I've I found myself that for for certain tasks, uh, writing a speech, writing an article, particularly that the right use of AI, whether it's ChatGPT or Bard or something else, it can be like a creative friend on your shoulder, yes. just throwing you some seeds to start with. And I found it saves me probably about 25% of my time that I might have spent on that. And it adds a little bit of extra thought and quality. The overall product, if you want, is mine yeah. completely, 100% at the end, but it's just sped it up. Is that how you're finding it? Yeah, I would fully agree with that, actually, because people, when it came out, I don't know if you remember this, like, what was it, last year or two years ago, when it started to come out, and to mainstream people just immediately recoiled and thought this is something evil and and actually what it's doing is it's just giving you another tool to work with like you said so for example when i'm using it in school i would never allow it to overtake my workload completely like i would never allow it to be everything i rely on i just use it to influence or just to give ideas really the the one the one way we use it in school actually the children use it quite a lot actually i think they use it more than me to be honest but they use it in terms of Canva, I don't know if you've used Canva before, it's a design, it's a design tool. And if we're ever designing anything online, like flyers or posters or whatever, then there's AI tools built in that they can use. So image generators and things. And we always use it for ideas. So they never use what they generate, but then they can base the, like inspiration, basically. And they also use it for, um, we've got one called, there's a free one actually called CuriePod that we use, and it creates full lessons, like full PowerPoint slides and everything. It's like, it's like a gold mine, honestly. It's amazing. <laughs> and if you got addicted to that, it would be like, it would be too much. But then they can interact with the slides. So they log on and they type as you're going and everything. So they use it a lot as well. And so you've got, you know, some of the younger stage students using technology that the majority of their parents probably don't use. And some of their parents are even quite fearful of. Yeah. Do you find you have to create a connection or an explanation between your use of it, uh, the students, children's use of it, and the parents' understanding of it? Or are the parents just happy for you to push on? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. They, well, we've never had any negative feedback. Um, and what we do in the school is we put, we're doing it this year again, we're putting on parent events. So where the parents will come in and they'll actually work with their children, which is really interesting. I actually just had one today. And the parents come in and the kids teach the parents, which is great. Because then, well, the best way to learn something is to teach it. And so the kids are learning at the same time and the parents are learning. And, you know, the amount of parents that have said to me, oh, I could use this in my job. I could use this for what I'm doing. I, and like Canva, like the, the design one, oh, we could make flyers with this for X, Y, and Z. So it's really interesting to see them start to, I mean, kids are on technology all the time. The parents probably look at their kids and think they know so much more than me already. Um, but we just, yeah, we've never really had any negative feedback from that, which has been, which has been good. I, I imagine it might come at some point, but um, not to this date, um, which has been helpful. And now another area of technology, we, I touched on in the introduction, social media. Um, you obviously are very active on TikTok with Organized Educator. Uh, do go and check it out, everybody. <laughs> and I was looking earlier this week at, at some of the content you put on there, particularly a, a day in the life piece. Um, which involved it involved you talking a bit about how tired you were. It involved you lying down on a desk and then and sort of marching off, walking off in the distance with a with a breakfast club fist <laughs> sort of parasol. But in terms of portraying the real life of a teacher, what what what's a, a week like? How many hours are you putting in? How often are you engaging with parents? How, how's a, a busy week for you? Yeah, so it's, it's hard to quantify because my contract is 35. That's 35 hours is my contract. That's what I get paid for. Um, but then you also have, I think, 30 to 40 hours that you make up on top of that within a, a kind of agreement that you set out at the start of the year. So that's extra things like parents' night and all your events and discos and all that stuff. You agree on what you're doing at the start of the year, basically. So there's that. But everyone knows that teachers work more than their contract. I mean, that's not a that's not a new, like if, if teachers walked in at nine and left at four, school wouldn't be a very fun place to be. So most teachers will do, I would say most teachers will do an hour extra maybe in the morning, depending on their schedule, and then minimum maybe an hour after school. Um, I personally have made it so that I never take work home, but that means that I just have to stay a little bit later. Um, 
if people have families and things, they have to go. It's just, it's very flexible. Like I would say it's one of the most flexible work environments out there in terms of your hours in a day, not in terms of holidays and stuff. That's quite rigid, but, but it is very flexible in terms of like, I need to leave at three o'clock. Okay. I need to leave like today. I had to leave at half past three. And so I left at half past three and no one batted an eyelid at that because in my head, I came in an hour earlier. I came in at eight. So you just get that flexibility. So a normal week, I would say people would do anywhere between 45 to maybe 60 at a push hours in the school that I'm working in. Um, that would be quite extreme. I think the national average is around about 60 hours a week. That's people working at home, people choosing to do extra. It's, it's a tricky question to answer. I'm not going to lie. And when the school holidays arrive, how much work do you have to do in those? Or do you manage to to take a complete break? Yeah, I like to relax. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I love to relax. <laughs> no, it depends what holidays. If you're talking about the summer holidays, I'll always do three or four days towards the end of the summer holidays where I'm in school setting up my class. And again, it's that way. It's like you kind of have to. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing your tail for the first week of school. Some people don't do it. I, I get that. They've got family commitments and things. They've got childcare. All that stuff goes on. Um, for me, I, I just need it. I need those three days at least. Sometimes it's five. Sometimes it's a week. Um, a lot of people use their holidays for that. I, I don't know that it's the most healthy thing in the world, but for me, I just I need it. Like I can't do without it. So it's it's quite a it's quite a sort of work hard, play hard environment in a way. I mean, perhaps different from how that is sometimes meant. That the term times are intense. There are a lot of hours, there's the evenings, there's the extras that you put in. And then when the holidays come along, the school holidays, you're trying to take as much of a break as possible. Yeah. So you've got to enjoy that sort of up and then down sort of lifestyle rather than just a gentle continuum through the whole of the year. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what your work schedule is like or what your holidays are like, but this is kind of how it works for me. So the first week of the summer holidays is always like exhaustion <laughs> like it's just <laughs> and you take a week and most people only get a week you know so because it's so intense up until that point the first week is usually oh, you know and then you get your break and, and your holidays you really can't complain about the teacher's holidays um but it is that first week and then the last week is always uh, i need to go back to work i need to get into work and it's a bit i don't know if you're you're probably not like that because i don't know you don't get as the school holidays but but yeah it's it's a very strange sensation in, in the holidays yeah I can imagine. And I want to try and get under the skin a little bit of what it really feels like. So let's perhaps just take the last term or no. the, the weeks that have gone so far of, of this term since uh, the beginning of the year. Yeah. What's been the highs during that over the last you know six, seven weeks? What are the bits that may think that was amazing? That's why I'm a teacher. Yeah, you're asking that in January. That's a, that's a hard question. <laughs> no, um, I would say January is... Okay, okay. <laughs> No, I would say January is probably the hardest. January, February is like, there's, it's just, you know, dark nights and sorry, like dark mornings and it's, it's tough. The highs are always for me, the student interactions. Like that is, that's what you do it for. I mean, it's those moments, I know it's, it's really cheesy, but it's those moments of the light bulb coming on or someone really struggling with something and finally like getting it. It's really, you can't quantify it. You don't know when it's going to come. You don't know if it's going to be weeks until the next time you get that moment. But for me, it is the best feeling when someone just gets it. So this, this month, we've been doing fractions, decimals, and percentages. And for some people, that just blows their mind. Like it, the, the, the difference between the three just, you know, and because we are so fast paced, like you've got to get everything done. Sometimes they just don't ever get it. You know, that is it. But this month, we've been seeing a lot of light bulb moments. And, and I love that. Another thing that I love is seeing people come out of their shell. So we do a lot of, we do a lot of shows. Um, we do a lot of clubs and to see people. I remember a couple of years ago, my football team, I run the football team in the school and it was the cool kids, you know, the cool guys were on the football team. And by the end of the year, every single one of them was singing a solo in the, in the school show at the end of the year in their like end of school show. And they were amazing singers. Like the boys were just fantastic. And that for me was a moment because it was like, they would never have done that if someone hadn't pushed them to believe in themselves that they could do it. And I love those moments. Like, see people come out of their shell. That is just, you can't explain it. You can't, like, and you feel like you've had an impact as well. I mean, I've been very lucky in my work to, for, for many of the last 30 years or so, to have worked very close with teachers and with, with schools. And, and 
what you say there resonates with with a feeling that others express me i i also a long time ago used to lead youth expeditions overseas and mountains and jungles and places like that and and there would always be many points in that but individual ones for each person where they would come out of a shell or they would conquer a fear or they would just nail a skill that yep. they had been trying to to pick up and it it's incredibly rewarding so just going to to the flip side of the joys of the light bulb moments and student interaction what are the moments that maybe make you question or not that bad maybe just think that was an awful day what are the things that are also real part for teaching there, there's lots of things that teachers complain about but are tough you know there's a lot of things that about the job are tough you don't want to sugarcoat it to, to anyone if anyone was wanting to come into teaching you wouldn't want to say oh it's all you know rainbows and sunshine i think the thing that not gets me down the most but it's just allowing things to pile up yeah i've got myself to blame like i know these things are coming up i know that next week i've got report cards due i know that next week i've got this survey to do with the children and i've just forgotten to do it. you know it's those things that pile up and then you think oh i feel a little bit overwhelmed here with all of the other stuff rather than just i thought teaching was just going to be me in a classroom you know me in a class full of kids and that was going to be it that is not the truth like that is not what teaching is that's like i would say that's like 40 percent of your job the rest is just everything that goes into building those moments so i think for for me personally the things that that are the lows are letting myself get snowed under a little bit also when you feel like you're not making an impact, that opposite, that opposite side of the coin when someone isn't getting it, when you feel like you're just, you know, banging your head against a brick wall constantly. You know, I've tried to explain this to someone four, five, six, different, different way. I, I'm out of ways of explaining it and they still don't get it. And they feel that's a wee, a, a wee bit or a little bit <laughs> defeatist. Um, sometimes you think, you know, am I a bad teacher because they don't get it? That's not the case, but it can feel like it's on you if they don't get it. So. There's the there are two sides to that coin. It's the best feeling when they get it. It's the worst feeling when they don't. So well, there'll be a a proportion of adults who might be listening to this thinking, I've still never got fractions <laughs> either. And and whether that was down to their teacher at the time or themselves, who knows? Yeah. But many of us will have a recollection of of a teacher in a positive sense from from when we were younger. Someone who who inspired or or just maybe even gave us the kick that was metaphorically needed mm -hmm. at the time. I'm wondering from your perspective, what have you seen that makes the difference between being a good teacher and being a great teacher? What's that extra percentage that you think, wow, that that's inspiring? Uh, the extra percent is um, building good relationships and showing that you care about that child. So I've, I've now taught for five years and I can see, I could see that if I was 20 years down the line, it's another class. It's the same routine, just another bunch of kids. And you see them every day. You do the same things as you did last year. And actually what you need to do every year is you need to reset and you need to realize this is 30 individuals that are here for an experience with you and everything that you do matters. So the extra 10%, the extra little push that makes you a great teacher, I'm not saying I am, but the teachers that I've experienced that are great teachers are the ones that go over and above for the children in their class by building good relationships with them, interested in what they do. What did you do at the weekend? You know, uh, asking them and remembering about their lives, uh, thinking about their wider achievements out of, outside of school. You got a black belt in karate or you got well, black belts maybe a bit high, but you know, that kind of thing really makes a difference for children and helps them buy in to their education if they see that they've got someone that cares. And it's so, it's such a simple thing to do, but sometimes as a teacher, you, you get lost in the weeds a little, in the woods a little bit. You, you just kind of, I need to get the curriculum. I need to get this done. I've got all these deadlines to meet. We've got exams. We've got, you know, essays due. The things that matter to the children are probably the interactions you have with them on a day to day basis. I mean, even if I asked you, you could probably remember a teacher or two that you had that you probably don't remember much that they taught you, but you probably remember maybe it's cheesy again, but how you, how they made you feel in class or something that they did for you or even a joke that you had like an in-joke with them or I mean I'm even thinking of two or three just now from primary and high school that, that gave me that feeling. Yeah definitely there are I think three or four teachers who I can picture now and and sort of think about the moods or the the conversations rather than necessarily what I learned uh, as one teacher I can also remember for for negative reasons but um that that's quite a small number of teachers of all of the teachers I would have met that have 
have stuck with me many years later. You you mentioned about resetting, and you obviously taught through the COVID mm. times, through the lockdowns. How have you, your pupils, have your school managed to reset after that experience? And what what has the impact actually been on on the young people who you teach? Oh, it was awful. Like the whole the whole experience was just I would never go back to that. You know, it was just. I mean, that was my first year teaching. So it was a strange, it was a strange first year. I was in, in the class six months or maybe even less than that. What was it? February or something? March we locked down and, um, and then I had the rest of the year, you know, at home just, and the school I was in at that time, it was much more about health and wellbeing. It was much more about checking in on the students and seeing if they're okay. And, and it was an awful experience. And then equally as bad was what happened when we came back, which was the hybrid. Everyone had to be socially distanced, you know, uh, the winter lockdown. I mean, the whole thing was just dreadful, necessary, but dreadful. And the impact, so uh, academically, the school that I'm in hasn't seen as big an impact as other schools, probably j- down to parents, home learning, that kind of thing. It was take, it was, it was very well engaged with. And so academically, I think nationally, they claim that it's only like three months behind or something. I think that's a farce. I don't think that's accurate. Um, but in our school, we're, we're, we're back on track. There's probably gaps in their learning, no doubt. I mean, I'm finding that in my class. I'll say, oh, you learned this. And then I have to be like, no, they actually didn't. They weren't even in school at that point. So then I noticed that there's gaps, mainly in general knowledge. Like that's what I'm noticing. But the biggest impact I would have to say, you know, at the coalface is um, social impact, learning how to deal with people and relationships. That's been a big, uh, we're seeing it come through now. We're seeing like, so the children that were in, well, we have primary one, primary two, are the early years of, of school, so year one, year two, year three. We're seeing now that they're all coming through and you can track in your mind what you would expect a year six or a year seven to behave like. And it's different now in a lot of ways, even just in the way that a lot of children deal with social situations and interactions. It's, it's really interesting to see how that's changed. Um, I don't know why. I don't. Are there specific either policies or approaches or strategies being adopted in your school that are now different from what they were before because of that impact on social engagement amongst the young students? A hundred percent. We've fully switched now to a fully switched now to a nurtured approach, um, which is much more of a restorative approach to behaviour um, rather than punitive. So, in terms of the day-to-day in the classroom, what that means is I wouldn't have a behavior chart on the wall. I don't have names. I mean, that would be quite archaic now. You wouldn't see that in many schools. Um, and it's much more restorative. You know, there's, there's good points and bad points that I'm not here to debate which one I prefer um, because it's just the way it is. You know, I've got to do what the school does. Um, so the, yeah, there's policies that are coming through from government level. There's policies that are coming through from council level, like local government and even just individual schools. So I would say, yeah, it's definitely had an impact in terms of social I mean, we even have like, like we, we have different initiatives, I would say, maybe not policies, but initiatives in the school now, much more of a drive for health and well-being rather than fully curriculum based. Like, for example, we have to take the children outside to do outside learning, I would say, double the amount than we did before, at least. Um, so that's a full like shift from what you were doing before. And even just things like that just changes a day to day life completely. You've been in teaching now for five years, two schools. Uh, you you talk about it through well to me now, but also through the through your TikTok platform as well. So I'm I'm interested to know, considering a lot of the people who listen to this are people who are starting on a career. They may be pre career, still at college. They may actually be in a first or second job. But if you could go back in time, five, six, seven years to your younger self. What advice would you give to yourself with the hindsight you've got now about things to do better, things not to do, things to do faster? If you could go back and say, I've got three bits of advice I want to give to to young David, what might they be? Three bits. Okay. <laughs> um, number one would be, don't worry, it, it will get done. Like The work will always be there. And so your to-do list will never, ever be done. And that's just work life. And I always wanted it. I always wanted it wiped clean. You know, I wanted a fresh slate every day. Just be okay with some tasks still being there at the end of the day. You know, you're, you're, you've got some things that will take a couple of weeks um, and you'll get to it. So the work will get done and don't stress about it. Easier said than done. Um, I would also say 
make sure you work on relationships with staff. I think that's really important. Not just teachers, management, leadership, you know, the school janitor, um, classroom assistants or teaching assistants. Every member of staff in the school plays a role. And I think as teachers, sometimes we can just isolate ourselves. Um, and especially as a young teacher, you feel like you're there to work and you feel like you're there to be a teacher and you just keep your head down, but actually got to build relationships with people. Maybe not even just with staff, like see if you go to an inset day or a different school or you get, I mean, I, I would say I've done all right with this, but people are the core of teaching. And if you don't have good relationships across the council or across different schools, it can be quite an isolating job. Um, and you, you need to feel like you've got people that support you, have got your back there. Um, third piece of advice. Oh, this is hard. I, I would probably say the same thing, but about the children. So make sure you are taking time, not just to focus on curriculum. Really important that you get through the curriculum. Hey, don't get me wrong, that is your job. But children will give you more if you give a little bit to them. So I feel like I've done okay with this. Again, I could probably do a little bit more of engaging with them on a personal human level rather than just, I'm your teacher and, and I'm a, the authority in the classroom and you will listen to what I say and you will do what I ask. You know, Actually, what you're wanting there is relationships because then they will do what you ask. Um, I think that's the three pieces and I would give. If linked to that, if, if I was starting out and thinking about teaching, what are the questions I should ask myself? What are the things I should say, this is what I need to think about in order to make my own decision about whether teaching's right for me? Um, you'd probably want to ask yourself if you're okay with the salary. First of all, I mean, just being honest, like you have to look at that and weigh that up, obviously. Um, you could earn a lot more money in the private sector. That's just the way it is. Um, you'd have to do a different job, but you know, you probably have to ask yourself if you are passionate about it because there'll be days where you want to quit there'll be days where it really gets you down and it can be a tough tough job um but the days that it is like that your your underlying passion and love for the job gets you through you also probably want to ask yourself if you've got the energy for it <laughs> it's like you know it is a full-on job like you're on your feet most of the day you're working with children that are energetic you have to give them a lot of energy it is a tiring job um and I probably would, if anyone was asked, wanting to get into teaching, I'd probably ask them why, what is your reason? And if it was like, oh, I love the holidays, you know, you probably think, I don't know if it's worth it just for the holidays. <laughs> I don't know if that is. Yeah. So I would probably ask you, what is, what is it you love about the idea of teaching? Has it been inspirational? Has it seen a difference in people's life? Is it um, having an impact in your local community, making a change, helping other people, that kind of thing? I, I think, Dave, what you've given us in this, conversation is is almost like the door to the staff room has been opened a little bit for the outsiders to peer in because you've been clear about some of the realities you've mentioned there in the end about the salary you've mentioned about needing the energy you've mentioned about need being passionate because some days are tough and you've also through the conversation inferred about the work-life balance and and you know some of the impacts you're dealing with still post-covid from in there but but actually, what really shines through for me is what you were saying about those those light bulb moments, the student interaction, and 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 the pieces where you just know. And teaching is one of the few jobs that can do this, where you just know that at that moment in time, you have made a difference to another human's life. And and so that I think is you know it's it's inspiring. the The role of teachers in teachers and teaching is perhaps not as celebrated and respected as it may have been decades ago but the high points and the difference and the positivity that teachers make when when they just get it right and the students get it right and the relationships are strong are are incredible as i said earlier i've, I've been lucky to work in around education for many years and have seen so many examples of that so so Dave, thank you so much for for opening that door to the staff room for us. I've got one final question. You're dealing with students and pupils all the time and you're seeing both the careers, yeah. although they're still very young, both the jobs that they might talk about, but also the jobs they have absolutely no knowledge of at all. What types of roles or jobs do you think we need to get on and explore? Well, a lot of people go into tech-based jobs nowadays, but actually that sounds like when someone says, oh, I work in technology or work in STEM or work in tech, and 
or work in IT, maybe what you hear normally. I mean, that can sound quite dull and boring, but actually some of the things that these people do is incredible. So the things that I'm interested in, like we, the, the one person that I would love to just sit and pick their brains on was a person that came into uh, our school. It was a STEM careers thing. And they did a talk about their career. It's fascinating. They designed prosthetic like organs for people. But the level of detail that he went into, I think it was it was like a gullet he had made for someone or something like that. I mean, there's always people out there that are in IT or in tech related jobs that you just don't associate with IT. You just think someone in IT is just sitting behind a desk and doing coding all day or fixing the company laptops, you know. But actually, there's just like all these design folk out there. I would love to pick their brains and see how they got into that career. I think it's fascinating, you know, peeling back the lid of tech and going deeper and deeper into what people are doing that, of course, someone has to have a job doing it, but perhaps you don't think how it gets done and therefore who is behind that. So we shall dig into that a little more. The people behind artificial intelligence, if I could sit down with them and talk about it, I'd be really interested in that. Brilliant. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Thank you for being a guest on Careers Unwrapped. It's been wonderful to meet you. It's been brilliant. Thanks for having me. This podcast is sponsored by We Are Futures. To find out more about We Are Futures and how we can introduce your brand, business or organisation to the mass markets of tomorrow, visit www.wearefutures.com. Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.